Or what president campaigned on the normalcy ticket? He campaigned that he wanted to, to return the world to normalcy. Who, who was that? Wendell Wilkie? No. Who? Uh, yeah, I guess so. No, actually, no. Uh, cool, no, no, it wasn't Coolidge. No. It was the guy before him. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Warren G. Harding. Walter Gamaliel Harding. Warren Gamaliel Harding. And the, he campaigned on the normalcy ticket. He said, let's return the world to normalcy. Well, he did. Uh, within six months after he got in, chicanery was rife. And uh, Al Capone moved into Chicago, and <laughs> the world returned to normal. <laughs> of course, a lot of people got mad at that point because uh, they didn't realize that he was one of the few philosophers around who recognized the fact that strife, murder, mayhem, and rape is normal. And uh, he did. He simply returned the world to that. Uh, he was, uh, uh, his, uh, his particular administration, since the uh, politics are in the news today, uh, was known for what? major uh come on what what the major scandal correct that is correct uh, the coffee pot dome scandal now where and why did they call it that that's right it's a place in colorado and uh they have a big motel there now and it's dedicated they have all kinds of memorabilia of the scandal and stuff like canceled check stubs and you know, tickets to Mexico that were used by the various guys who cleared out. <laughs> by the way, wouldn't that be a great kind of a museum if they had a museum that was really related to real stuff? <laughs> you know, this is the bag that William O'Dwyer used when he made his quick midnight flight out of the country. And, you know, you have a picture of O'Dwyer standing beside his sack there as he's leaving for Mexico. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is the actual key to the apartment where the late mayor of New York James uh, Walker, uh, this is the key to his mistress's apartment, and uh, this caused a disastrous scandal, and, you know, it would be kind of great to have a picture, you know, of a ticket stub where Jimmy Walker and his uh, chick you know, went down to Atlantic City and uh, disguised as Mr. and Mrs. L. W. Grubbage of Fordham Road, where they were. <laughs> now, that would, be a, that would be a fantastic museum. I'd go to that one, you know. As it is, I'm not a museum cuckoo particularly because you know they always have tapestries of the middle ages which doesn't really do much to me i i mean i, I suppose there are middle age you know people who dig the dark ages and all but that that never has turned me on much uh, i don't relate but that way uh however i do i would like to see say uh, the derby hat worn by john dillinger on the occasion of him knocking over the rushville indiana bank so this <laughs> you know this, this derby hat it's <laughs> may be seen in the following photographs, which were taken immediately after when he was nabbed in the Lake County Jail. So uh, I would, uh, wouldn't you love to see a shirt actually owned by Al Capone in his greatest period? Well, for those of you who don't know about this, you know that Mr. Capone was a famous peacock. Uh, this is a side of Mr. Capone that few people know about, that at one point Al Capone owned something like 350 suits, and all elegantly tailored. And uh, when they finally put the nab on him, and uh, he was in uh, in uh, in court, uh, where they were trying him on income tax evasion, <laughs> and uh, of all things, but uh, he was being tried on income tax evasion, and every day he arrived at the court in another suit, all of them magnificently cut and tailored. He the the first day he arrived in a canary yellow suit with a lavender tie and a lavender shirt. And white spats. Now that's enough to to start the uh, proceedings up. Of course, there was a great roar of applause from the audience because uh, in those days, apparently, uh, laws. Uh, you know, the, the courtrooms were great theaters. You know, <laughs> so Al arrives with his uh, with his beady eyed bodyguard. Incidentally, another thing about Al Capone's uh, clothing, if you're curious, that he bought all of his stuff from Marshall Field in Chicago, and uh, he maintained the great account there. And uh, the shirts that Al Capone wore had special reinforced pockets in them. And he, he wore beautiful shirts. He, he loved shirts. He had a thing on shirts. And uh, they were all beautifully tailored, individually made to him and all. And they had detachable collars. He loved these elegant collars that came up, you know. And uh, he had special pockets built in over the breast, see, where he carried his snub-nosed 38 caliber Derringer. <laughs> I mean, you know, in case you
used to get in any arguments in the elevator, stuff like that, which he, which he would uh, then, of course, use. But uh, Mr. Capone, uh, I would love to see a, uh, you know, a, a, a museum that has a couple of his actual shirts that he had. Now, why was he called Scarface? Correct. And uh, he did have a scar. I knew you'd get right to the heart of that. And I, 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 one thing I say about my listeners, they have fantastic uh, insight into things. They just drive right into the facts. And he was called Scarface because he had a scar. And he was very sensitive about it. Uh, and by the way, nobody ever called Scarface to his na face. Scarface. He was never referred to by anybody as Scarface. Oh, you ever call him Scarface, forget it. You got yourself a concrete overcoat fast. In fact, it, one of the guys he rubbed out, uh, his gang rubbed out, he rubbed them out because this guy was heard to say in a restaurant, uh, he was talking about Al Capone. This was another mob leader whom Al had considerable respect for because he was doing pretty good on the west side, that mob. And uh, this particular mobster was heard to say, that's that Scarface goon, you mean to tell me that I'm going to have to put up with him? Well, that really ticked Al off. And that was a classic mistake. He said it about the wrong guy. And so he wound up, you know what he wound up, that guy wound up in a horse trough full of lie. After, of course, being subjected to various indignities, like being carved into the shape of a soap cake by various thugs using razor blades. <laughs> oh, they really were serious about it. So this is the side of Capone you never see. Uh, another thing, uh, Mr. Capone, uh, uh, you know, he comes from New York. How many people know that? He was, yeah, Brooklyn, see, and, and he got his scar in Brooklyn. And uh, he later, by the way, ironically enough, you see, because he was a professional toe pro, and uh, Al recognized, uh, you know, that he was scarred up by this guy who gave him a couple of shots across the face with a razor, that uh, it, was, it was nothing personal. It was purely a business thing. And uh, he bore no ill will towards him. In fact, later on, hired that very same guy as his bodyguard. He recognized, the, you know, the professional job that the guy pulled. That was all. Which uh, I kind of, I kind of dig. And and uh, Al had great charisma. For those who uh, have uh, were fortunate enough to get near him, or unfortunate, depending on how it worked out, that he did. He had fantastic charismatic qualities. And uh, whenever he would meet anybody, they were always immediately impressed by this fantastic animal radiating power that he had. It just radiated it, see? And you never see this in, in any of the movies about Capone. He's always this thug walking around. I'm the spot on the west side! You know, oh, come on. Apparently Al uh, had a great sense of humor. And uh, he, uh, and he always thought of himself as a businessman, incidentally. He was always very hurt by the fact that people uh, considered him a, a mobster and a thug. He, uh, the mobsters and the thugs were the guys he rubbed out, he thought. And uh, he, he was conducting a legitimate business. And you know what he was listed in the Chicago phone book as? Yeah, you're interested, right? Antique dealer. And uh, yeah, that's right. And he even had an antique shop, which uh, never was open. Uh, and whenever anybody would call, it would be this voice saying, he ain't here. And that would be the end of that. But that was his legit, <laughs> his legit business. He was a dealer in antiques. And he went out and he bought a lot of junk and just loaded it in the shop. And that was the end of it. But uh, he was, uh, you know, this is the kind of museum I would go to see. And I, I wish somebody would, would just once in the movies, you know, do the, do the real Al Capone, the way he really was. He's a fantastic... And by the way, he's always presented in the movies as being much older than he really was. How old do you think Mr. Capone was at the absolute peak of his career? Well, I'll tell you. I won't keep you in dire suspense. He was uh, around 26. Uh, he was 26 or 27 when he was really on top of it. And uh, never was part of the mafia, by the way, in case you're curious. He had no, no, no truck with that. He called, he called all the guys in the mafia Mustache Pete's, uh, which uh, <laughs> he, never, he never bought that scene. He was a businessman, and uh, he dealt in services. Now, uh, he said everybody likes to drink a beer. Somebody's got to get the beer for him, and I make the beer. He says, I make good beer. And he was famous because the beer he made was better than the beer that the other guys were making at the time. And that was the secret of success, that they turned out a good product. And uh, <laughs> uh, one, uh, one little scene, though, Al, Al was, uh, had tremendous personal strength, by the way. He was very, very strong. 
physically. He was like a bull and very tough. And uh, Al was uh, given to at times when uh, somebody would say something to him, just hit them in the eye, knock them flat, which he did on several occasions. And at uh, one time, you know, if they ever showed you how, how these guys really do it, you know, they're, they're really tough mobsters of the, uh, the Capone ilk. Uh, it would make a great movie scene. Although I don't know how you could show the movie scene. If, it, it, you know, he, he observed all the old uh, Italian traditions, like uh, for three days before a, uh, a funeral of uh, one of his compatriots, he would not shave. Uh, that's a Sicilian tradition, you don't shave. Did you know that? For three days. And you let your beard grow. And, of course, flowers are very important. He uh, would send flowers to all of us. For example, he would knock a guy off on Wednesday, and uh, if the guy's about to be laid away on Tuesday, the following week, uh, the, the, uh, he would already have ordered the flowers. He wanted to make sure he got his order in, see, before the guy was, before the guy picked, you know. Uh, he, he was called, uh, you know what they used to refer to it as, uh, if, uh, that uh, if a guy was ready to get knocked off, it was, uh, the, the game term was, he's picked up a marker. Either that or he's got a number. Let's see, he's got a number. Or they'll say, somebody give out a contract on Nick Brown. Well, uh, a contract means <laughs> what it sounds like. <laughs> Incidentally, they really were contracts, and they signed contracts, and they had all kinds of if, ands, or but clauses. That, uh, that the, Even in the contract, it would specify who's going to buy the ammunition. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Who, pay, who pays the expenses, like the getaway car, one thing to another. Uh, speaking of uh, mobsters, this is WOR, and uh, we're here in the big town here in New York. This is the hometown of Al Capone, and uh, uh, <laughs> who, was the, who was his famous mentor? He studied under him. A well, famous mobster named Torrio, T-O-R-R-I-O, Torrio, and uh, Al was uh, kind of an apprentice. He studied under the great Johnny Torrio, and uh, he, he learned his lessons well. And uh, who is one of Al's great students? Lucky Luciano. Oh, yes. Uh, Lucky was very impressed at how well Al managed his businesses. And he did, <laughs> he did quite well. And so this is WOR New York. Would you please hit the money button, please? Uh, I have a commercial here, which is, according to the copy, it's supposed to be read slowly and romantically. <laughs> oh, yes, okay. There you are, at an intimate table graced by candlelight. The sounds of strolling musicians create a mellow mood. <laughs> Listen, I'm strolling around there. <laughs> get him out of here. Get that bum out as you enjoy a sumptuous dinner prepared in the continental manner. No, you are not in a Parisian cafe, but in the delightful Le Champ restaurant right in the heart of Manhattan on East 40th Street near Park and Madison. At Le Champ, you'll not only find authentic French dishes, but also an international cuisine of exotic meat and seafood entrees, entrees, as well as hearty steaks and tender prime ribs, all at moderate prices. So, come to the strolling musicians, to Le Champs, the continental restaurant with the strolling men, the international menu. For reservations, call LE26566, Le Champs. <laughs> Lucky support. You know, uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a great uh, student of people like a poem. <laughs> you know why? Because, of course, when, when you grow up in, in a town like uh, Chicago, and I did grow up in Chicago, and don't make any mistake about it, the part of Ch uh, Hammond, uh, the town I grew up in, is as much a part of Chicago as, let's say, uh, uh, the Bronx is part of New York. I mean, it's there, you know, Chicago. Well, the... These are great legendary folk heroes in Chicago, and uh, and they, they they continue to be legendary folk heroes. And it was that great, like here in town, uh, New York City, people still talk about DiMaggio. Who never saw DiMaggio play? You know, he's a legendary hero. He's legendary. He doesn't seem real. Uh, Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, legendary hero. See, well, <laughs> one of the most legendary characters in Chicago, of course, is Capone, and. And uh, you, you hear, uh, you can't be in Chicago long if you spend any time in Chicago. And you run across traces and elements of Caponiana. You know, places where, 
Well, as a matter of, yeah, Capone, yeah, it's a whole thing out there. They, in fact, uh, you know that in, in Chicago, if you get the right cab drivers in town, they will take you on a tour of Chicago in the Loop area and point out places where various uh, events took place in the Capone saga. They'll point out the place where the Four Deuces was, which was a very famous speakeasy where Capone hung out. In fact, he ran this thing. And uh, they'll, they'll show you places where uh, the uh, Jack McGurn was shot, machine gun Jack McGurn. They'll, they'll show you the, uh, the vacant lot where the Valentine's Day murder took place, and, you know, the great the massacre and all that. And, uh, and if you get the right cab driver, they, they'll, they'll take you to places where you can actually see on the side of a building. You can see where slugs went right down the side of the building, where a 45 caliber Thompson submachine gun, you cry, you know, right down the side where they gave it to somebody. And uh, it would, I think a museum like that would be fascinating, you know? The actual sawed-off shotgun used, uh, you know, Al's favorite weapon. By the way, he was far more colorful, you know, than, than the movies ever show him, and a total professional. And he recognized other guys' professional uh, skills, see? So there's a famous scene, uh, you might have seen the Capone movie, a famous scene where, where uh, Capone was in this... Uh, he always had a, there was an inn out in Cicero, Cicero, Illinois, which is out, if any of you have ever read anything about Capone, I'll give you some, uh, some, uh, some authentic geography, that Cicero is almost directly west of Chicago, and it's, uh, it's one of these, it's an outlying suburb, just like the town I grew up in is a, is a suburb on the south side, uh, Cicero is a suburb on the west side, and the reason that they went to Cicero was because it was beyond the jurisdiction of the Chicago police. And Capone and his mob literally owned the town of Cicero. They, the mayor was like uh, one of their, uh, <laughs> was one of their employees. They, they owned the police department the whole bit. Well, he was, uh, he would hang out in a place called the Hawthorne Inn. Now, the Hawthorne Inn was right next to a big racetrack, which was down the road a bit, the Hawthorne Racetrack, which you might have heard about it. Well, the Hawthorne Inn was a kind of an elegant eating place, and it was, it was Capone's hangout, and he had rooms up above where he lived when he was uh, working, you know, I had to work late a lot in his work, you know, and, and <laughs> that's a fact, that he was always complaining that he didn't get enough time with his family, see, he did, and his wife and kid and all that stuff, and, and so uh, Capone would spend a lot of time, you know, going over the books and, uh, you know, things like that, cleaning guns and stuff, you know, all the stuff you got to do in that racket, so, so Al would hang around this place. So one day, one of the mobs uh, that was warring after Capone, uh, there were always inter interscene wars, great battles between these mobs, and that's what the, the whole mob gangster scene was. And uh, the Chicago uh, people's attitude, really, was a kind of one of, uh, of applauding them. Uh, in other words, whenever there was a big gang war, everybody would applaud because they figured the mobsters were knocking each other off. You know, that was okay. It was like, it's like if there was a big war among the cockroaches under your sink. Well, you wouldn't get mad. You just figured, you know, <laughs> good enough for it, so you don't take sides. So this particular mob, on the day in question, Al was having lunch in uh, the Hawthorne Inn, and uh, he was with one of his compatriots, and they were, they were have, going over some difficult things about the books or something. And there was a lot of uh, strife going on at that point because Al controlled many, many uh, joints of illegal speakeasy places where he was selling them beer. Well, there was this other mob that was bugged because they wanted to sell beer in that place and uh, so forth. And so they figured the best way to, 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 to get to the heart of the matter was to bump off Al, at which point then uh, they would be in the saddle and, uh, you know, the rest of the mob will have to knuckle in. Once Al is under the cover, then it's, uh, it's all over. So... How they did it was interesting. They uh, they realized that Al Capone has uh, had about 47 lives. I mean, there have been hundreds of attempts on his life, ranging all the way from bombs thrown and everything else, and he was impossible to get. And Al said it, too. So uh, one day, they decided, we're really going to do it. So here's Al sitting in, the, in his restaurant. He's eating away there. You probably saw the scene. It's a famous scene in the movies. And uh, if it, if the way it actually happened was even wilder than the movie scenes. For one thing, Al, uh, Al Capone, in spite of the way they always play him, like the Rod Steiger syndrome, Capone was not an illiterate lout, and uh, he was very articulate, extremely funny, 
had great uh, magnetism and had absolutely no fear whatsoever. He was not the craven wretch, you know, who always at the end begs for mercy, anything but. So Al is sitting in there having lunch, and he's dressed in one of his mustard seed colored suits with his elegant ties on and his spats, when all of a sudden, uh, right in front of the place, there's a lot of cars, it was a big race day, see, a lot of cars were parked out there, and uh, the pre-race gang was waiting, when a car drove along in front of this place, and apparently sprayed the front of the, of the building with machine gun slugs. Except they didn't. It, it just made a lot of noise, and everybody jumped up and ran around, and uh, it was a ruse. It was a ruse to get everybody jumping up and running around. And uh, they were shooting blanks. They just drove past the place, and they were, ah, you know, and a lot of blanks. They didn't shoot any sh uh, shells at all. Well, it worked. Everybody jumped up and started a mill around, and Al was with his... Uh, with one of his right-hand men, and uh, they, they both waited for a second, and sure enough, immediately after that, another car goes by, and there were ten of them in succession, in a convoy, one after the other, that rolled past slowly, and each car was loaded with guys with machine guns, shotguns, and rifles, and they just riddled the entire building, they just, boom, 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 and they just let loose everything, they had these great big drums of machine guns, uh, and these were Thompson, by the way. These were Thompson, with what, what, what uh, became later known as Tommy guns. A Tommy gun stands for the term Thompson, the Thompson submachine gun, which fires a drum of 45 caliber slugs, and it is a deadly, deadly weapon. The thing, uh, I think it has a firing rate of about 1,600 slugs a minute. It's a blah, blah, and, you know, 35 slugs like that. And uh, anybody who knows anything about the ballistics will tell you that one of the most damaging of all weapons, uh, as far as a, sh a shell itself, is this 45 caliber slug. It hits like a bowling ball. So uh, they rolled in front of this building, and they just let it go. They just raked the building. They, 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 they were just, they didn't care how many people they killed. So the point is they wanted to get out. So they just raked it up and down sideways. They hemstitched the place. By the way, that's the term they used. They says they really hemstitched it. I mean, down the front and down the other side. Crossed it, see? Hosing their machine guns up and down the place. And one after the other, ten cars rolled past and just blasted the, you know, the daylights out of this place. In fact, so much so that they destroyed storefronts of buildings on either side. I mean, the places were like wars. They, they just blasted this place, all the ribbons. Well... Here's Al, the minute that this happened, you know, Capone has got great reflexes. He's been in this scene before. So instantly, he and his buddy, they hit the dirt like good GIs. They, they, you know, they hit the ground. And the last car that goes by, a guy jumps out of the car, the last one. And he's dressed apparently in coveralls or something. And he jumps out of the car with his 45 Thompson submachine gun. And he just runs to the door instead of just driving past and he just hoses the interior of the place down, see? <laughs> just empties a drum of a hundred shells into this place and then runs back in the car and they go, where'd they go? Well, what do you think Al did? When this is going on, Al jumps up. As soon as the last guy, he jumps up and he shouts to his friend. He says, did you see that? That's the gun. He says, we got to get some of that. That's a fantastic gun. <laughs> He said, that's better than shotguns. In other words, Al Capone was much more interested in the technical aspects of the attempt on his life than he was in the fact that we're trying to kill him. Now, how's that for cool? He had never seen a Thompson submachine gun. It was the first one that was actually used in a gang war, and he, you know, he was impressed. I mean, you know, that's like a guy working with an old disc recorder, and he sees his first tape recorder. He's got to get one, you know? And uh, he just said, man, that's, that's the gun. Well... Uh, so Capone was so cool that he went out and uh, and he paid. That he recognized the fact that you know if it wasn't for him, that wouldn't have happened in that neighborhood. So Al uh, Al pays for the repair of all the buildings for blocks around where the shells hit. Yeah, he just paid for that. And it was only one person actually hurt in that whole scene. And it was loaded. It was a, it was a, almost a miracle. Well, it was a miracle. One guy. And it was a guy getting out of a car who was just coming there that day to see the races, and he got nicked by a ricochet. 
and that was it. But the fantastic uh, episode, now that, that's the kind of stuff that added. Now, I, uh, I remember one time as a kid, uh, you, you used to occasionally run across things like this. Uh, of course, uh, the, the gang scene uh, is, is still quite common out in Chicago. Let's face it, it's, it's not going away. See, I'm saying it's, uh, it's underground. It's very different than it was. But I remember one day, one time, uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, during, during uh, just one of those afternoons, you never know, you know, when all of a sudden something's going to happen, one, uh, my old man had a run in with, with one of the mobs. Yeah, I never told this story. My, my father was a big hero at one time. And what happened was this, that he was working in this, uh, in this office. He's working for this big company, and he was working in the, in the office. And, and his job every day, he was a cashier or something in this big plant, that every day he was to take the receipts down to this bank. This was East Chicago, Indiana. And uh, by the way, East Chicago, Indiana is famous for one big thing. Uh, that was the day, that was the place where John Dillinger, the, his end was sealed in East Chicago, Indiana. And, and what happened was that his mob held up a, held up a uh, bank, the Dillinger gang, held up a bank in East Chicago, which was about two, three miles from my home, and they knocked it over in the middle of the afternoon. And on the way out, when they were driving out of town, they were just driving right down the main street, they, uh, they stopped. There was a traffic cop. He was just standing on the street corner there, and uh, they just pulled up to the traffic cop. Like, he didn't know. He didn't know the, get, the mob had even held up the bank. They were about two, three blocks away where the bank was, and this car suddenly stopped. And he thought they were going to ask uh, uh, instructions how to get out of town or anything like that. So, and so he just walks over, and as, they, as he walked over, this guy in the back seat just takes a gun out, and bam, he shoots the cop in cold blood. In other words, they, they stopped to do it. Well, at that point... There was a plain clothesman, a detective who was off duty, who saw it. And he was so enraged at this scene that he saw. When this car went rolling out, he, he, he vowed that he would spend the rest of his life capturing Don, uh, Dillinger. And that's literally what happened. Now, that's a fascinating story. Well, this all occurred not the, in the same area. And so my old man one day is taking the receipts to this place. The same bank, by the way, that was held up by Dillinger. And uh, he had this car, and he went there. And I was a little kid at home, so I remember all the newspapers coming and, and everybody taking pictures of him. Uh, it's one of the few times, that, oh, I was a little, I was preschool even. I must have been about four or five, because uh, it, it has a curious memory. I remember flash bulbs going off, that kind of stuff. But uh, the old man, apparently, was driving down the street to deliver this money, the receipts, maybe four or five thousand dollars, to this uh, bank. And uh, he was driving along, and he was with another guy, which was highly unusual. He usually only went by himself on this thing, apparently. And he saw in the mirror some guys following him in a car. And he had, a, he had an idea. He just, it just was like, a, like an instinct or something that uh, somebody, somebody was after him, see. So with that, he decides to try to lose him in traffic. And so he tried. He, he steps on the gas. Well, the next thing that happened was these guys were driving like mad up and down the streets, and they're firing away at him. See? They're, they're ready. They want to rob the, the payroll or whatever it was. They, they Apparently, that was an inside job or something. They knew, see? So they chased him up and down the streets, and uh, they were firing away at the car. The car was getting peppered. The old man uh, uh, stayed ahead of him. And uh, if, if uh, they, they made a terrible mistake. They, if they had known the old man, they wouldn't have tried it. No, he was mean. So what he did, instead of just running away the way any normal person would do, the old man's driving like hell, see, and they're chasing him. Well, what do you think he did? These guys are right behind him, firing away, when suddenly the old man got an idea. He slams on the brake, puts the car in reverse, and crock! He, he really gave it to these guys. Well, that one guy went through the windshield, <laughs> still holding his 48 or 35 or whatever it is he had in his hand, and the other guy was not cold in the fish. Well, the two guys, my old man and, and this other guy, jumped out of the car, and the old man grabbed the guy with the gun, and the other guy sat on the head of the other guy that was lying there cold in the fish. 
And the police arrived, and it turns out these guys were very famous wanted gunmen. <laughs> At which point the old man got a $5,000 reward, and uh, we didn't see him for a month after that. But uh, that, that's the truth. That's, that's uh, you know, one of those stories. So this, this whole legendary scene of, of uh, mobster activity is, uh, is really part and parcel of the scene out there. Uh, of course, the Dillinger thing, which uh, is even even more part of the folklore of that area. Of course, a lot of people are, are laughing to be hell now. All of a sudden, it's uh, you know, got a whole spate of books come out prove that Dillinger really was a beautiful human being, and you know all that stuff. But uh, he was, you know, he was he was just another uh, another uh, you know just a low IQ mobster is what he really was, a very violent type. And uh, so the, the famous escape that Dillinger, that everybody knows about, the one that he caught the gun, well, that, that was a big core celeb uh, because that sheriff, there was a sheriff out there uh, that was running this jail, the Lake County Jail, and it was in, uh, in a town called Crown Point, which uh, was very, very near to where we lived. See, Crown Point, there's a county seat down there, and they had this jug, and, of course, they brought the Dillinger from what I, you know, what, what I've read about it. Now, don't, don't immediately think Shepard was a big grown-up guy and, and knew all this stuff. I wasn't. Because the legend of Dillinger is as big out in that area as, say, uh, oh, if you go to places out the, you know, out the West, the legend of Jesse James. They reenact it and all that kind of stuff. You know, and you can see there's a tour. You, did you know that there's a Dillinger tour out in northern Indiana? You can take a Dillinger tour if you're a real Dillinger cuckoo. Yeah, it's a it's a bus tour, and they'll take you to various towns and places where uh, Dillinger's mob had been knocked over the bank, where they had planned these various <laughs> you know big deals. And in fact, they even take you there. Of course, to end the the big tour, they'll take you to the cemetery in this little Indiana town where John Dillinger is is uh, there. You know, and, and uh, they they have pictures of his house and all that jazz. Well, Dillinger, the legend of Dillinger is very big out there. And so uh, it got to the point, of course, and it still is, the legend was much bigger than the reality. And so now uh, the Dillinger gang robbed at least, oh, 12, 1,500 banks uh, in various places. This is the legend, you see. Every town has a place where Dillinger reportedly had robbed it. Well, uh, if, if he had robbed all the places that he's supposed to have robbed, that, ba that gang didn't have a day off for at least 30 years. They, you know, they were, they were going night and day, maybe three or four, ten banks a day, you know. But uh, they, they're not quite proud of the Dillinger legend out there. And uh, the, 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 the famous escapade where he escaped from the, from the jug out there is still a matter of contention. Whether it was an inside job and Dillinger had paid off, you know, the, the various uh, officials, or whether it actually was the way they claimed it was. You know, he'd... Uh, supposedly caught this gun out of soap, and it was such a perfect gun that uh, he had everybody uh, uh, cowed, and that they uh, they, they finally uh, let him go because he was threatening them and so forth, and his mob picked him up. Well, that, there's a famous picture, and uh, once in a while that picture is, uh, you can buy it out in, in Indiana in that area, signed even. It's a famous picture that was taken when Dillinger checked in to that jail. And, of course, Dillinger was a big star. He, uh, you know, he's a famous man. And then uh, here's Dillinger checking into this little tank county jail. And the sheriff has his arm around this, uh, this uh, star, see? And it, it, it looks like the most jovial scene, you know, like uh, Kiwanis Club greets visiting celebrity. And he's got his arm around there grinning like mad, see? And there's Dillinger looking kind of uh, modest. Well, it really was nothing, sheriff. And uh, I won't be here long, but it's kind of great to be in your cell for a while, that kind of thing. And, and uh, that picture was a giant cause celeb, which even to this day causes political repercussions out in that area. Whether or not, and uh, of course this poor sheriff apparently has never lived it down or didn't, because that picture was just one of those uh, things that was taken in the middle of the Dillinger came in and, and put his arm around the sheriff, you see, and... and uh, and somebody in the crowd said something. They both laughed at that point. And the picture was taken, and it looked like the sheriff was, uh, you know, the best friends with uh, Mr. Dillinger. So the scenes, uh, <laughs> the scenes that go on out there, and uh, this, uh, I hope this didn't bore you, you know, this uh, kind of stuff that uh, 
you don't hear much talk about. But my uncle, for example, I had an uncle Charles, who uh, his proudest uh, his proudest boast to the time he died. I remember a little kid. He'd, he'd uh, every time we had a you know family would uh, have a Sunday dinner, and Uncle Charles would show up with Aunt Clara and that. Well, Uncle Charles would tell his story. He worked in a in a cleaning place. Well, maybe you didn't know that one of the big businesses that the, that Capone ran was the, was a cleaning uh, a, a string of cleaners throughout Chicago. Well, that of course he, he was in the protection racket, one thing or another. And uh, Uncle Charles was very proud that he worked in a cleaning place that was bombed by the Capone mob. And uh, oh yes, they even had it at home. He had on his mantelpiece. And he had it in a frame, like he had a little wooden frame on a on a on a green felt background. He had glued pieces of the pineapple. It was a bomb that was used to blow up the cleaning plant where he worked, and it was an actual bomb that the Capone mob used to finally take over the plant. Incidentally, they did then take over the plant, and uh, Mr. Capone uh, ran a, he, he apparently ran a pretty good cleaning operation, and uh, he always believed in low prices, good quality work. And uh, very fast service, and he got it from his drivers. There was not much lip, uh, I mean, from the drivers. And uh, so Uncle Uncle Charles <laughs> would would tell us about the time the the place blew up. And you know what they did, apparently, according to at least Uncle Charles's story, that uh, when the word came out that the that the owner of the place had decided he wasn't going to buy protection from the Capone mob, well, it was obvious something was going to happen. He didn't do that to the Capone mob, you know, without getting some action. So uh, the night that they were to bomb the place, the Capone mob telephoned the the cleaning plant. And thoughtfully too, they didn't want to hurt anybody. They 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 called the, the cleaning plant and says, "Get everybody out," because because uh, we're doing a survey. The way they put it, <laughs> we're doing a survey. Well, they did. Uh, they took the hint, and everybody cleared out. They all waited out there, hid on their porches, put tin hats on. And sure enough, about uh, two hours after the plant closed, everybody was cleared out. This uh, big black Lincoln. And incidentally, that was the car that Mr. Capone used in many of his big deals. He had this big black Lincoln. This big black Lincoln rolled quietly past the cleaning plant, and an arm suddenly moved quickly in the back seat. Guy had a good arm too, from what they say. He was an expert, and he just tossed this pineapple right through the front window, and there was a count of three, and kaboom! And forever, that cleaning plant was ensconced in history, and that became a big celebrity. Thousands of people came from miles around to take their cleaning to this plant. And the, by the way, did you ever hear the story of the exploding suits? Oh yes. One of their little tricks was when the cleaning plant refused to. Uh, have anything to do with uh, with the protection? The gangsters had a system of making a suit that had special chemicals sewn into the seams. They would then send it to that plant for cleaning. As soon as it hit the cleaning fluid, kaboom! <laughs> so you see, there's a lot of things you can do to get ahead in this world, gang. And uh, what the hell, working is one of the last of them to try.